Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Oh, wow. Who said that? That worked well. I greet you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hello, Hannah. How are you this morning? I feel like you're about to do a puppet show. <laughs> Uh, for those of you who are new here, I'm, I'm Dan, I'm the pastor here, and uh, welcome everybody as we gather together. It is, ah, it's a beautiful day. Uh, I, I assure you we'll be out before 5.30, so if you need to get to the Grey Cup party or wherever it is this afternoon, you can, uh, you can catch that as well. It's hard to, like, Winnipeg or Toronto? Uh, really? <laughs> Anyhow, we are a praying people, and we begin our services very simply, and that is I ask you just to bow your head, and as God brings a person or a place or a moment in your week uh, or the person beside you in the pew to mind. Just take a moment to pray for them. We just want to kind of calm ourselves down, quiet ourselves a bit, and then I'll pray for us. And then we'll have a few announcements and begin with some singing. So let's pray. Father, it's good to be here. It's good to be together with people who love and care for us in a place that is safe and secure. Uh, for ourselves, for our children, for each one of us. And I thank you for a hundred years of that in this place. People have come and felt loved and known that you loved them and they've been well fed and cared for and kept safe. And that's a rare place in this world and we are grateful for it. Father, for those who are watching us online, we thank you wherever they are, near or far. Uh, we've had folks that you know and you've spoken to them through the little gift that we give through this morning. And I thank you for that. So Father, in all these things that we do, we ask that you would speak to our hearts and our lives and our minds and give us strength where we're weary and if need be, correct us where we need to be, but do it all in love. And I thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was in college, and uh, we had a, a role that I sat in. We called ourselves the Big Boys Back Row Bible Study. Uh, and it's good to see the Big Boys Back Row Bible Study as well attended this morning as well. We know that Brett's not feeling 100% yet, but uh, I don't know if there'd be room for Brett in the Big Boys Back Row Bible Study this morning. <laughs> Doug, you've graduated to the Big Boys Back Row Bible Study. <laughs> so it's nice to see you guys. Uh, I'm just going to grab my glasses so I can read the uh, one. <laughs> First off, I just want to thank everyone who participated last night, brought food and prepared food and all the hours that were spent in doing that. And uh, thank you all for cleaning up after. We had a great Thanksgiving banquet as we kick off the Advent season. It's hard to believe that we're only three weeks away from the longest night of the year. Uh, and then it'll get a little sunnier. We've got a few things coming up. I'm, I'm off to Regina for Monday and Tuesday for what's called ordination interviews. I'm not being ordained, um, did that for a while. Um, but going, I'm on the committee that, that oversees that. So I'll be gone to that. And as a consequence, there'll be no Bible study or prayer meeting here on Wednesday. So uh, if you do attend, that's why we're not. Thursday, uh, elders, just to remind you of our budget meeting here. If you do have any budget uh, items you want to bring towards the budget committee, I know I spoke with the youth committee, but any other uh, committees that need to present uh, budgetary uh, requests, please let uh, Danny's, our uh, financial sec. No, Doug, sorry. Where's Doug? Doug, Doug's our financial uh, secretary. Please let him know in advance of the meeting so that we can prepare the budget and then present it to you as a congregation at our annual general meeting. You have the final say in that. Speaking of say, uh, we do want to communicate with people well, and we have several avenues for doing that. Uh, one is we do have a regular email list that goes out, and if you'd like to be on that email list, you can just fill that out on these little yellow cards. I think most of the pews have them. Just say, put me on the email list and put your email address on there, and that goes out uh, at least once a week. We also have mailboxes at the back, so if you're, you or your family would like a mailbox, uh, people often put Christmas cards and just different items in there when we release financial information it often goes to those. So if you'd like a mailbox, please just, again, I'd like a mailbox. And thirdly, we do have a Facebook group. Yeah, it's a private group because of, we're a community. But if you'd like to be on that, uh, just go onto your Facebook and look up Leader Alliance Church and put a request in. I think there's a, you will acknowledge that you won't sell anything on it or something. But there's a couple of conditions, but nothing critical. Um, and then we'll approve you for that. And that gets updated quite often during the course of the week. So uh, Facebook, 
We also have a YouTube channel, if you want to participate us with, many of you are watching us that way, called Leader Alliance Church. So we're trying to communicate uh, effectively with people. Uh, and if you want me to mail you something, just give me a mail, but I'll, I, I can still do that. And uh, it'll cost me 58 cents to get it to you. But uh, whatever way, we want to communicate so that you can know what's going on, because often I don't. And uh, it's helpful that somebody else does. I've learned you can lead sheep if you've got good dogs. But, all right, some things coming up. Um, November, our ladies' Christmas social is here on the 29th. Punch at 6 and supper at 6.30. Is that correct? Okay. Community Christmas caroling. We have been asked by the community to carol from 7 to 7.20 and then from 7.20 to 7.40 uh, at the Millennium Gardens. And we could either do that as all 40 minutes or we could break it up into two 20 minute groups, whatever you wish. Uh, and they would like us to kind of walk around downtown, go into stores, fall in love, I don't know, but just go caroling. So if you can meet us at the Millennium Gardens at seven o'clock, uh, we'll provide um, the, the song sheets for us and then we'll carol. So if you can commit to 20 minutes or 40 minutes, whatever you can, would be much appreciated and uh, the community would really appreciate it. And then we can just be a part of that. We'll give you some hot chocolate and candy canes and whatever you need. Uh, so that's coming up December 1st here at the Millennium Gardens. Then on the 18th is our Christmas program and encouraging your Sunday school departments, uh, each one to participate. Uh, I've got something I'm working on for the adult Sunday school. And then on the 24th at 7 p.m. is a traditional Christmas Eve service here or program. And then the 25th, which is the next day, will be a non-traditional Christmas morning service in the Fellowship Hall. So Christmas Eve will be here in this spot, but Sunday morning, Christmas Day, will be over in the Fellowship Hall and we'll do something uh, original there. Like Dylan once said, my tombstone will say, let's try something different. <laughs> All right, have I forgotten anything? Today, decorating. Right, today after church um, is our Christmas decorating shindig. And uh, Felicia and Vanessa are in charge of that. I want to thank them both for stepping in. But we're not going to do the tree today. Is that correct, Felicia? We're going to save that for later in the week. Uh, but we will need help transforming Thanksgiving into Christmas. So, Thanksgiving. Dylan, men. Yeah, at the yeah, hangar. Yep, yeah, first Saturday, December, men's morning at the hangar. Saturday. Good. We've been having good turnout and good discussion there and, uh, and good food. All right. Anything else? Sorry, announcements went a little longer this morning. We want to worship in song this morning, so I'll ask the team to come. So while we're getting ready, um, youth group this Friday here at the church, 7 o'clock. Please stand with us. Sing with us, worship with us.
goofed on that one. That was a him. That was a him. I was supposed to give you the number. I think there's another one, and I won't miss it.
Savior divine, have thy own way. the offering. I want to thank all of you. You'll see the numbers look good in the bulletin. Uh, we do want to take time to pray, especially for the Loudon family. We know that Jack's uh, had some tough days. We want to remember him, as well as I think half of Grady and Colton's classes were missing, and uh, I know Roslyn was short a few this week, so we've had lots of sick. And I met somebody who said they were busy, and I said, I'd like to introduce you to town. Uh, I know your world's been up and down and sideways as well. And uh, if each of us took a moment, we would say the same things, up and down and sideways. And for Elaine as well. So I'm just going to write those down. As well as for each one of you. So bow with me. Father, this way can often be hard. We walk through the valley of shadows at times. And so, Father, this morning, with true responsibility of it, we bring those who walk through the valleys in these days. We think of our community for so many who are sick and weary and the healthcare workers and the burden that it has placed on them and the responsibility that is placed on them. And so we pray for each one at the care home, at the emergency department who work in the uh, clinics, our doctors, nurses, care providers, and the maintenance folks and the ones who clean and provide the food, each one who is part of giving hope and strength to us. Father, we thank you that we live in a community with a hospital and pharmacies and those who love and care for us. But we pray that you would deliver us during this season, deliver those who are weary. We think of Elaine now as she continues on with her struggles. Father, you know that you have carried her and brought her through so much. We had the joy of seeing her once again and now she's uh, not able to get out. We ask that you would heal her body, her mind, her soul, and her spirit. And for Jack and Brett and the Loudon family as they continue on with uh, the challenges, the sickness there, but especially for Jack, that you would strengthen him through this and that through this he would see your face uh, in his life in these days. Father, for each of us, it's been a full week and Christmas is about to happen and the world's about to get a lot busier. Think of Tam's family especially as they've just had those extra burdens this week. That you would strengthen her and each one that she loves and cares and provides for. Father, for each of us, we all have those things we bring forward to you right now in this moment. We thank you for the gift of life and health and food on the table. But we ask that you be merciful and give us strength. For all this and so much more, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll ask our ushers to come forward. <coughs> Oh 
Inspired just means God breathed. And that some way God breathed into the lives of people and out came the words they wrote. We believe that all scripture, all the books, are God breathed and are beneficial, profitable to teach us and correct us in how we think and if need be then to, to rebuke us and to train us in how that we can live right so that we're fully equipped for what we need. So we believe that this book is unique in all of history. That God breathed into the lives of people, and through it, we can be taught, correct, trained, and brought into a deeper understanding and a deeper walk. And so each week after we sing, I come up here for 20 minutes, 40 minutes, depends on the day, and we unpack about a paragraph of a book. Now, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less, but if you divided all these books into paragraphs, there's enough here to preach for 25 years, uh, a paragraph a Sunday. So we take a book and we break it down and we kind of work through it. And the purpose of that is twofold. We kind of walk down two roads. Uh, the first is to understand what it meant to the original audience. So that those who originally were, because we want to understand what it meant so that then we, once understanding what it meant to them, can understand what it means to us. I've jokingly said every good sermon is like a grade 10 birthday party. There's always a take-home bag with a Hot Wheel and an Archie comic, right? There's got to be something that you can take home and then press into your life as well. So we seek to understand through context and language so that you in turn can live it out in your context, speaking your language. So that's why we do what we do. It's a bit... Like the stunning shop manual. This is for the early 70s Kawasaki 250 uh, twins all years. It is instructions on how to own and operate and repair this bike. But it originally was written in Japanese. So it had to be translated into English. And sometimes there's funny-isms in here where the Japanese shines through. 
But its purpose is to teach you so that you can operate. But the problem is that this manual isn't exactly like your Kawasaki 250, which is probably rusty and bad wiring and needs a new piston. So you take the knowledge you have learned here, which is translated from the original language, and you bring it at home so that your Kawasaki runs better than, but this is the factory manual. So this is kind of the factory manual, written in Greek, Aramaic, and Hebrew, translated then into English in a variety of sources, then we learn it in, a, in an academic sort of sense, that then we can take it and apply it so that our rusty, wounded, weary life can live according to the manufacturer's directions and do well. So to that end, then I spend a portion of my week uh, studying and reading and going back and forth and digging down into deep and that. And I thought about it a bit like this. Uh, all this week, I watched Donna prepare food. I don't know how many hours it took, but it took her quite a while. She took raw ingredients that in some ways were inedible, no one wants to eat raw turkey, and transformed them through her skills and her education and her abilities and the tools that we have at home into a meal that you could eat and enjoy. Good food. All preaching is, is taking the raw ingredients of scripture, going through someone who's got a bit of training and filtering and, and, and transforming it into a meal that you can then eat but I can't make you eat it. All I can do is present it to you. You know, we eat with our eyes, we eat with our nose, all the kind of things. All I can do is give you a meal and you go, well, I like turkey, but I'm not a fan of yam. So, and there may be moments you go, yeah, Dan, that's great, but uh, maybe I don't agree with you here, or that's not you know, my thing, you know? I understand that. But my job is to give you a, the best meal I can so that you can eat it, and in eating it, you too may grow. So that's what this next section is about. This is my meal so that you can eat and I trust enjoy. Now, we had a lady one time who walked in and those of you who know the story, it's a very funny story. Um, she said, is this a sermon or a comedy show? <laughs> and I said, as far as that, yeah, maybe a little bit of both, you know. Um, my goal is not to be entertainment, but there are moments of entertaining. We, we all eat. Um, I guess the kids are gone now, so I can tell you this. But when I did my ordination interview, after when it was all done, a guy walked up to me and said, Esau, you could tell someone to go to hell and they'd look forward to the trip. And I went, <laughs> <laughs> So my goal is to engage you so that you can enjoy, but ultimately, it's the food that does the work. The work of the Spirit working in His Word and through His Word. All right, that's what we do, why we do it, and a little bit of how we do it. And I've already prayed, so I don't have a good segue into the next section. By the way, you could cook yourself as well. You don't have to. You've got your Bible in front of you. There's great tools online. And you can learn to be a really good cook. And we're trying to develop cooks here, Keith and Dylan and others. We're trying to make good cooks here as well. But uh, don't think that, well, if it has to come from this plate. You cook every day and enjoy the Word every morning. I want to begin with a question. What would life be like without consequences? Great Big C saying that a few years ago. I just want to live my life consequence-free. If you've ever seen the movie Groundhog Day with Bill Murray, they explored that question. What's it like to have each day where there would be no consequences because you would live the next day over again and Bill does all kinds of crazy things because he realizes that life without consequences means you could steal or heal but it wouldn't make any difference. And great minds have pondered this question. What would life be without consequences? And I just want to read you a few little thoughts. Someone said when you choose an action, you choose the consequences of that action. Good or bad, you will choose ultimately the consequences of your behavior. Carl Jung wrote, the wrongs we have done, thought, or intended will wreak their vengeance on our souls. Darkness. But it was Benjamin Franklin, I think, who put it best because Ben had a way with words. He said, he that drinks his cider alone will catch his horse alone. In other words, if you don't share in the good times, when the bad times come, you're going to be alone as well. So if you're going to drink cider, do it with friends. That way when you chase horses, those friends will come and help you. <laughs> he who drinks his cider alone will catch his horse alone. So today as we're working our way through the book of Hebrews, we come to a section on consequence. For four chapters, the author of Hebrews has been elevating Jesus higher and higher and higher, showing us the glory and wonder and beauty and superiority of Jesus over all things. 
He's shown us that Jesus is the great high priest who ushers us in to the throne room. That Jesus speaks truer than all the prophets ever could. That, that he's more glorious than angels. That he is the son in the house compared to Moses who was the servant of the house. He's greater than Joshua who crossed the Red Sea and led the children into Israel. Each time he elevates Jesus. He is the one who ushers us into the presence of the Father, who cries and pleads on our behalf. He is the son of the Father's house. And then he poses the most difficult and perhaps perilous question. What happens if we reject that? What happens if we've been exposed to Jesus and we've heard him and we've known what God does and we say, you know what? Not for me. And we walk away. What are the consequences of walking away from the Son, rejecting the high priest's invitation to enter the throne room, of ignoring the message of the living word? Can we simply shut our ears, ignore his pleas, and walk away? What happens if we say, thanks, that's a nice meal you prepared. That looks great, but you know, I'd, I'd just rather eat cat food. This is Hebrews. So take your Bibles with me this morning, and I trust you have one, and I encourage you, if you don't, I had somebody email me, what Bible should I get? We can get them for you, um, and, or we can point you in the right direction. We recognize this morning also that as the Bible was translated from those three languages into English, there's different translations. Uh, back in the 1600s, King James translated it to preserve the beauty of the English language. Later on, as we changed language, it's been translated, and you might have a, an NIV, a New International Version, or a New American Standard, or whatever you have. They're good translations. Um, but I trust that you have a Bible, and so we're just going to read a couple of verses this morning. Hebrews chapter 6, and give you a moment to turn there. Just 4, 5, and 6. Normally we have one of our uh, folks comes up and reads it, because it's such a short passage this morning. Uh, I'm just going to read it. Hebrews 6, starting in the fourth verse. For in the case of those who had once been enlightened, tasted of the heavenly gift, been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Before we unpack, preacher's favorite phrase, by the way, unpack, before we unpack this, I need to be a bit of a warning bell ahead of time. Uh, first off, there is a whole lot of interpretations of this passage. Unlike cooking, when someone puts a chicken before you, you go, that's a chicken? Mm -hmm. Scripture goes, well, it could be a chicken, but it could be a duck, or it could be a ham. There's a lot of ways of looking at this. In other words, who is he talking about? What does impossible mean and onward? Uh, Ray Stedman simply says, this solemn warning marks one of the great theological battlefields of Scripture. And I'll be honest, there's no one, including Dan Esau, who is able to answer all the challenges presented in this passage. All I can present to you this morning is the meal that I've been convicted of and brought to you. Now, Bible study on Wednesday night is a place we dig into this and we take the ingredients and we really get down to the basics of it. So if you're interested in exploring more of what we share about here on Sundays, I invite you to join us on Wednesdays. It can be a little convoluted sometimes, but it digs a lot deeper because we have a lot more time. And secondly, if you've read, many of you were raised in church and heard or perhaps believed something different than what I'm about to share with you, um, that's great. Uh, this passage invites differences to under of understanding but I will present to you uh, what I believe is what Scripture speaks here. All right. The context of this is a bunch of people who had come to Jesus. They were Hebrews, Jews. And they're tempted, because of the hard times in life, to forsake Christianity and go back to Judaism. Because the Roman Empire accepted Judaism and it was rejecting Christianity. So it was safer to go back and, be, and follow the old law. And he's warning against them. And he describes now six characteristics, and he does this in detail on purpose, which we'll see, about the people who walk away and go back to the old ways. And it begins with a little phrase, it is impossible. Now, we're going to take that little phrase out, and we're going to set it over here, and we'll bring it back later on, because this is a funny sentence. But he begins with six experiences, and he defines very clearly those who fall away. Here's what's happened to them. And he begins with saying, those who have been once enlightened. 
We use that idea all the time, imagery of the light shining on. When you go to school, the teacher enlightens you. You see the light and you walk in that. So he talks about those who have been once or at one time been enlightened. What does that word mean? Well, the implication is that they've received some teaching, a pretty significant amount, about who Jesus is. The light of what they learned has shone down on them. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That this image is consistent. And they've had a significant exposure or experience to Jesus. And this knowledge or exposure, they encountered it. So this describes someone who's had, I think, a pretty significant teaching. Not someone who's new and going, well, I think I, you know, I heard who Jesus was. There is one of the uh, guys from Rock Solid, not Rock Solid, um, Teen Challenge said one time, you know, why do you name your God after a swear word? He, we're talking about someone who's had some notable teachings about who Jesus is. They were enlightened. Then he describes the second. He says, they've tasted. So we move from the image of light to the image of food, which is an image that we can, I trust we can all get behind. Um, he says, they have consciously partaken. Now I want to be careful here. Wayne writes this, a guy named Wayne Grudem. In this idea of tasting is the fact that tasting is temporary. And one might or might not decide to swallow or eat the whole thing. In Matthew 27, 34, Jesus says, they offered him wine to drink mingled with poison, and when he tasted it, he would not drink it. So these aren't people who take bought into the whole thing. They've tasted the edges of Christianity. They've had a little, little flavor of it. Maybe went to a VBS or a summer camp or went to Sunday school when they were young. But they, they've had the light, and they've sort of tasted what Jesus is. Uh, and the heavenly gift here, by the way, is, is Jesus. So they kind of know what he tastes like. The third. They are partakers of the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit. And again, they've come under the influence of the Holy Spirit. They have some shared experiences of the Holy Spirit. And what's notable here and important here is what he doesn't say. He doesn't say that they are born again of the Spirit, that's a nice Christian phrase, or that they've been sealed with the Spirit, another phrase used in Scripture, or the, the, indwelt by the Spirit, or anointed by the Spirit, or baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ, or filled with the Spirit. He simply says that they've partaken, they've had some measure of sharing with the Spirit. Thirdly, fourthly, and again, tasted the good Word of God. Back again to tasting it. They've sampled some of the goodness of God through His Word. They've had some experience with the Word. And lastly, they have tasted the powers to come. Uh, this is, they've seen the miraculous occur. So they've witnessed the power of God, uh, perhaps even in their own lives. Uh, so let me sum them up here. What we have here are people who have been exposed and experienced some Christian stuff. Maybe in their childhood, maybe in their early years, or, or even as adults. They've heard the teachings of Jesus. They've, they've tasted a little bit. They've sampled the work of the Spirit. One of my favorite meals is a charcuterie. You know, you just take a little sample of everything. And they've seen what God can do. I'll put it to you this way. They've come into your house. They've slept on the beds. They've felt the warmth, tasted the food, enjoyed the hospitality, been comforted and cared for, but they haven't moved in yet, really. They've just kind of done the Airbnb thing. They're sort of there. In other words, they've spent time with the people of God and they've come under the influence of those experiences and those teachings. But then something happens. They walk out the door, the tail end of verse 6. He says, they've had these experiences and then they fall away. If you have a, an NIV this morning, it says, if they fall away. We won't get into my favorite subject, conditional clauses in the Greek tense. Maybe not my favorite, but... And the King James says the same thing. If they shall fall away. But this idea presented here is, is a little difficult because this is the only time this word is used in the New Testament. It's like somebody gives you one spice you've never had before, and you go, I have no idea what to do with this spice. I've never, and this word here, fallen away, is never used in the rest of the New Testament at all. It's only used here, and that adds to the, the difficulty of translating it. But the idea is pretty clear. Because Scripture interprets Scripture. And we have a parallel expression and a parallel experience in 1 John 2.19. John describes what's happening in his church, or he's teaching. 
He says, they went out from us, but they didn't really belong to us. For if they belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going out showed that none of them belonged to us. So what we have here are people who have lived in the house, eaten the food, or at least sampled it, enjoyed the warmth, and they leave and they, they walk away. They were walking with us, but they walk away from us. And so scripture informs scripture. Hebrews 6 and 1 John 2 uh, describes these folks. They were there and they went out. I suspect many of you know these people. Um, I shared some of you about my brother. I have my brother's uh, new baptismal certificate, his uh, New Testament, all that kind of stuff. Uh, when I was in college, my brother was in prison for trafficking. Uh, and my brother denounced the faith very clearly, very openly, very publicly in our home and walked away um, and prayed for him for years. He passed away about a year ago. But he was a guy who was involved in church, leader in his youth group, but something happened. And he openly walked away. We were raised in the same. His story and my story are you know, like a bad movie. He was in prison and I was in Bible college, right? Um, but here's two guys who walked the same road, went to the same house, raised in the same churches. Two of us went very, very different directions. And I wonder, what happened to him? So I think all of us uh, know someone like that who was and walked away. But I want to stop here. Because there's a great danger in taking away hope from people. Say, well, the next passage says it's impossible. There's no hope for me. I may as well quit. You know, why even bother coming back? If you have been raised in the church and maybe you've wandered away and you're here this morning, I don't want you to walk away. Well, it's, uh, there's no hope for me. It's impossible. He's written me off. I'm... This is a very specific event occurring. See, because Jesus loves lost sheep who wander away. He goes and finds them. Matter of fact, he leaves the 99 sheep away and he chases them down and he picks them up and he brings them back. Jesus is like a woman who, who had all these coins and she lost one. And she spends her day with her broom sweeping and she finally finds the coin she lost. And it says, and there's great rejoicing. Uh, Jesus loves prodigal sons and daughters. He has a real heart for lost sons and daughters. Those who wander away and say, you know what, give me my inheritance. I've had enough. I'm going off, eat, drink, and be merry. And the Bible says he spent it all on wine, women, and song. Great little country song there, you know? And he, he, he spent it all. And you think, well, it's impossible for that boy to come home. It's never impossible for that boy to come home. Because that boy made a decision, and as he walks away, he thinks, oh, I'm going to go, and I'm going you know, to plead with my father and say, I'm so sorry, I sinned against you. And the dad looks down the road, and he sees like a coin in the dust, like a sheep caught up in the thorns. He sees that boy, and it says he ran down and he grabbed him and he wept and he said bring me a ring and a coat and a fat cow because we're going to eat and the boy if you notice the story never gets an opportunity to say sorry he never he just the father says good you're home my son that was dead is alive and he embraces him so i don't want you to think this morning well, you know what I, I i've gone to church and i've heard some stuff and you know what i walked away i guess there's no hope for me no no this is a very specific set and we'll get into it because god loves coins lost in the dark Sheep lost in the thorns, and sons and daughters lost to the hogs. Some poor hogs. They get a terrible reputation in Scripture. If you're a lost son and a daughter this morning, welcome home. If you're a lost coin, we want to pick you up. If you're a lost sheep, we'll come hunting for you in the thorns and brambles. Don't give up hope. All right. Oh, by the way, there's a condition at the end of each of those. It says there was great joy when the sheep was returned, great joy when the coin was found, and great joy when the son returned home. There's always, notice we're expecting to feel guilty when we come back, and what we find is joy instead. When we come back home, there's not, I told you you shouldn't do that. There's, oh, I'm just so glad you're home, I love you. Joy. All right, let's move on. Consequences. Now we take that little expression, it's impossible, that we put over here, and now we're going to bring it back into the text. For it's impossible, in verse 4, and then there was all that stuff in the middle, and then verse 6 clicks it back in. I should use PowerPoint more often. It's impossible to be brought back to repentance. Now, this is a blunt phrase that cannot be toned down. This is hot pepper in your chili. You can't pretend it's not there. This is a hot spice. And what the phrase literally means is without power. It comes from the root dynamis, which we use in English now. We use dynamite. It means power. 
So it, the word simply means that they no longer have the power to repent. They are lacking power. We see it in Acts 14.8. Again, scripture, interpret scripture. Acts 14.8, there was a man who's sitting whose feet were incapacitated. He had never walked. That word incapacitated is the same word we're finding here in Hebrews. Without power, he could not have the power to walk. And the writer of Hebrews says, if they have seen this and reject it, they no longer have the power to repent. Stay with me. He's saying, have walked away, they no longer have the power to turn around and walk back. Having changed their mind, they are powerless to change their mind. Having tasted the good food and rejected, they are powerless to acquire a taste for it again. You ever eat something and then get sick? I, I, hate, I won't go into graphic detail. I, I ate a bowl of honeycomb and I have vertigo and I get really, really sick when I get vertigo. And all I could taste for the next two days was honeycomb. I don't want to eat honeycomb ever again because all I can think of is how sick I was. Once you've tasted it you go and then rejected it, um, it's impossible to acquire a taste for it again. Now that's just kind of, I do like honeycomb and I miss it. But, uh, but here's why. Why they can't come back. Let me give you two reasons. First he says, how do we come back to a place of repentance and faith and why they can't? Well, the first reason is because they have rejected the very means by which repentance occurs in our life. Those of you who have been Christians for many years, you, you've come to the point where you said, this is wrong. You walked away. You said, I'm not going to do that. That's repentance. Turning your back and 180 degree turn and saying, no, I want to live for God. That old life is gone behind me. Uh, I'm, I've rejected that. And I'm going to walk. Well, how did you get to the point of where you rejected the old ways? A lot of us, it was we, we fell on hard times. We hit the bottom of the barrels. If you've worked with AA, you know that you've got to get to that bottom where there's nothing left. And you reach up and all you find is Jesus. See, here's what author is sharing, that we hear the teachings of Jesus, we taste the gifts of God, we sample the work of the presence of the Spirit, and we experience what God can do. That's what leads us to repentance. We hear what the Bible says, Jesus' word. We begin to taste and see what God can do with his people. And we begin to experience the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. And we start to, and it works, and it says, Scripture says that the, the first work of the Spirit is to lead us to repentance. And these are the very things that lead us to repentance. In other words, we come into the house and we say, I like this house. It's better than my shack that I was living down by, you know, the van by the river. We sleep on the beds. We go, this is better than cardboard. We feel the warmth that's provided. We taste the food and say, this is so much better than the swill I was eating before. We enjoy the hospitality and we hear the words and the music. And that leads us and we say, I want to be a part of this family. And we reject the old way of living because it is destructive. And we say, look, I'm home. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I was hungry, but now I'm satisfied. And we say, this is what my soul's been longing for. And you ever get to that place and you go, I'm home. Christianity is an invitation to go back to the garden, to come back home. But we have to leave the old life behind. We have to repent and return and renew and walk in newness. We have to say, I was dead in my trespasses and sins, but I'm alive to God in Christ Jesus. Repentance is turning our back and coming home. But if you've rejected all of that, you've rejected the means by which, not you, but in this case, the means by which repentance can occur. They can't come back to the place of repentance because they've rejected the place that's brought them there. It's hard to cross back on the bridge that you have intentionally burned. And the second reason why they can't repent. He says in verse, the tail end of verse 6, since they again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Now here is where context is critical. Remember, he's writing to people who were Jewish and they have come to Jesus and into this community and he brings them back to the image of the cross where the Jews stood there and cried out, crucify him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. This group of people. And he says, if you are tempted to return back to Judaism under the threat of persecution, and you abandon Jesus, then you're basically back to where you were when Jesus was crucified. You're back to rejecting him. He says, you can't repent when you reject Jesus. I love, it's like Bible study very often. I'll say, what's the answer? And Dylan always says, fire. That's the answer. But everybody else says, Jesus. I go, that's right. When in doubt, the answer is Jesus. 
And so he says, to reject Jesus is to return to the place where Jesus is nothing more than a false prophet or a criminal. To reject is to reverse the time and go back to being one of the mockers on the cross. Now here is where context gives us light. He's writing to Jewish people, and what he's describing through these five events is actually Mount Sinai, that place where they went on the mountain and Moses got the Ten Commandments and there was thunder and fire. Let me walk you through the images as they parallel. The old story parallels with the new story. He says they've once been enlightened. Huh. Remember when Israel walked in night? What was ahead of them? Pillar of, pillar of fire the night and a cloud by day. They were enlightened in the dark. This isn't TV, by the way. You can talk back. Um, they lived in the literal light of a burning pillar of cloud because it gets cold in the, in the desert, so God heated them, and it gets hot in the daytime, so he gave them cloud to keep them cool. It was really like the original central heating and central cooling. <laughs> He says, they were enlightened. They saw the pillar of fire. Can you imagine, you know, you're, you're cold and also there's a pillar of fire burning in your yard. You go, eh, I, I, I got my Coleman stove. I don't need that. Well, they rejected that. And he says, they've tasted of the heavenly gift. So what did the Jews eat in the wilderness? Manna and quail. They tasted the food that came from heaven. And then he says, they partook of the Holy Ghost. They drank of the living water. What did the Jews drink? They drank water from the rock. They, they the living water that was given to them. Then he says, they've tasted the good word of God. Huh. What did they receive on Mount Sinai? The good word of God, the Ten Commandments. And then he says, and tasted the powers of the world to come. They saw the parting of the Red Sea. He's speaking to Jews. And he says, if you saw all that they saw in the wilderness, if you saw the pillar of cloud, ate the man and the quail, drank the water from the rock, received the Ten Commandments, saw the parting of the Red Sea, and said, you know what? I don't, I, I don't want that. I don't believe that. This description, this section in Hebrews, describes those who had seen all that God had done, and then, and only then, had willingly rejected. Both verbs here, crucify and put to open shame, are present tense. This describes not just a single moment, but a perpetual habit of action. This is not a one-time slip-up saying, yeah, I, I doubt it. This is a continuing attitude of the heart. This is not a, a stepping away for the moment and having doubts. By the way, there's a wonderful verse in Matthew that says, even while Jesus was there, they had their doubts. This is not you and I, because we've all had our doubts. This is a willful, ongoing, progressive behavior of willfully renouncing everything you've seen, known, tasted, and heard. It's very intentional. I want to be clear here, because we've all slipped. We've all doubted. But this is not that. This is those who choose to willfully walk away. For here is the one who has been set free from slavery. And he walks up to Moses and he spits in his face. He renounces the commandments turns his back, goes into the desert, swims across the Red Sea, bows before Pharaoh, and says, I am no longer a Jew. That's the image of this person that we're describing here. And so the author throws his hands in the air and says, what more can we do with them? If we tell them that the scripture is true, they'll say, they, oh, I know that, but I don't believe it. You know, you read one holy book, you've read them all. If we tell them that God answers prayer and changes lives, They'll respond that, well, yeah, I know that too, but prayer is just another name for coincidence. If we tell them the Holy Spirit is powerful to work in people's lives and the gift of eternal life is good and will give you joy, they'll say, I, I got that, but, you know, I've yeah, been there, done that, and all I got was this lousy Valley View Bible Camp t-shirt. If we say that you have tasted the fruit of the Spirit-filled life and you say, and they say, yeah, I, I, it's just all plastic to me. These people are spiritual cats. Now, we love cats, but cats are the strangest creatures, and I think some people are spiritual cats. So you've got this cat in your house, and you buy them the best food. I went online, I found British Banquet cat food, 300 US dollars for a two kilogram bag, 150 bucks a kilo. So you bring them British Banquet, you say, here, eat this food. And then you get them a cat scratchy post. Found one made out of Moroccan hardwood bound with Egyptian cotton. You go on and yes, you can buy a Versace pet bed, 1700 US for a Versace pet bed. And you give them the best food, the best scratching post, the best bed, and they look at you and they walk over and they sit in the box and eat the dog's food. 
right? You go, what do I do with a cat like that? And we come to it, we say, we have the best food. Come and enjoy. I mean, we really have good food, actually. Um, but come eat the bread of life. And we say, come here and find joy. Come, we love you. We just met Donnie. We love Donnie. We don't know you, but we love you anyways. It'll take time for a yeah, bit. And Mike. No, I just will leave you there. <laughs> But we come, we say we love you. If you need food, we'll give you food. If you need clothes, we'll give you clothes. If you need help building your windows on your broken house, and no, uh, we'll help you. Come and be home with us. Come and eat at the master's table. Drink and enjoy the meal. And somebody says, you know what? I'd rather go sleep in the snow and eat cat food. I don't know what more we can do. So let me wrap this up with our take-home bag. What can we do? I want to end with two areas that we can work on. First is simply this, make sure it's not you. Make sure that you are not the one who's tasted the food and said, eh, this doesn't in my appetite. So I ask you this morning, how's your spiritual appetite? What are you dining on? Has the word of God started to taste sour in your mouth? Yeah, I've read this my entire life. I've been going to study and go, eh. I know there's a theological phrase for that. It's called, eh. That. <laughs> Have I disregarded the work of the Spirit said, I don't know. I'm not talking about doubt, because that's a biblical accepted phrase, but this growing cynicism and coldness. What light am I walking into? What am I reading, absorbing, and listening to? I find if I spend too much time on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, I start to get cynical and jaded, and my faith grows cold. What am I watching, reading? Who am I listening to? What conversations am I having? So first I simply ask you this, make sure it's not happening to you that this food is starting to sour, taste sour. And second, for those who have tasted the food, we need to do our part for them. We must never give up. See, this passage focuses on two primary experiences, light and taste. They see the illumination of God, they taste his food. They've seen it and tasted it, and they've excused themselves for the table. But living in a home where food is crucial, I've learned a lot about food, and I learned this, that one other aspect of food is not mentioned here, and it's found in 2 Corinthians 2, verses 15 and 16. 2 Corinthians 2, 15 and 16. For we are the fragrance, or the aroma of Christ, to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing, to one the smell of death to death, and the other fragrance from life to life. You see, we're not the food. We're not the bread of life. What you and I are is the fragrance. We're the smell. I have a friend, Rob, who's a veterinarian who has, was born without smell. He has no biological ability to smell. He and his wife run a veterinary clinic. And he can be in a room where it's green in the room. You know, he's got his elbow where he's up to his, well, you know, right? And the smells in the room would drop you dead. Rob, he just keeps working away. Because I make fun of him. You know, you put aftershave on Rob. <laughs> what a waste. I just wasted money on Rob. Because he can't smell. But those of us who can, smell is critical. So scripture doesn't say, in this case, that we are the bread of life. No, no, that God's made the meal. What well, you and I are is simply the fragrance that goes along with the meal. We are what the food smells like. Now imagine with me. I know it's at 10 after, sorry. Imagine you find this really great little bakery. You go to, where are you from, Purdue? No, where do you get your mail, Murray? Laporte. Laporte, all right. There is this great new little baker in Laporte. And you walk in, you know the smell of a bakery, and you order that fresh ground coffee. They've got fresh bread, and they cut off like an inch and a half slice, and the, and the lady there, she makes homemade strawberry jam, and you dollop out that on that fresh bread. It's an inch thick, warm from the oven, and the coffee, the coffee is enough to make you cry. And you, you just pick it up, and then just as you're about to eat, guy walks in. This guy has been working on a sewer on a hot day. He's brought with him the dog who's been laying beside him all day. And for some strange reason, he's got a dead mouse that he found in his pocket because he was going to take it home and give it to the cat. And he pulls out a three-day-old egg salad sandwich, and he opens up his thermos, and he's been drinking warm, fermented horse milk. And you take that breath, I don't care how tasty the coffee and how beautiful the bread, you are going to leave that room. You will turn your back 
on fresh coffee and fresh bread because of sour horse milk. Beloved, we are not the bread. We are the fragrance. And the warning for us is don't smell like fermented horse milk. Beloved, there are people who are going to come into our house. They will come to church. They will sleep on our beds, feel the warmth, taste the food, enjoy the hospitality, and hear the message, and they will choose to walk out the door. They will say, been there, done that, heard that at camp, don't believe it, I'm going back to Egypt. And we are not responsible if someone chooses to run back to Pharaoh's arms. But we can live our lives in such a way that when they get there, they'll go, I miss the smell of home. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the perseverance of the saints. We have folks here who have followed you for 80 or 90 years. Some folks here this morning, they're going, what is this all about? Thank you for everyone in between. Father, I pray that as those who call Leader Alliance home or watch us online and say, yep, that's my church, I pray that we would smell like fresh bread and good coffee to each one. And if there's areas in our lives that stink this morning, I pray your spirit would do his work and convict us and say, that's a stinky place in your life. You've got to deal with that and repent. Father, I pray that we would smell like Jesus. In his name I pray. Amen. Let's sing. <clears throat> you know what, I'm, I'm sure I'm not alone when I say that is one of those little bits of scripture that I've read over and over and over and kind of wrestled with and wondered how does this make sense because it just doesn't jive with, with a lot of other stuff. So uh, thanks for, I appreciate your your uh, explanation of that but if you ever go this late again and start talking about food and how good it smells i'm just walking <laughs> well, that's how it's going <laughs> yeah that's right please stand with us <clears throat> sandwiches and food <laughs> at the back after. Come, stay and join us. Well, now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless. Mm -hmm.